Hello folks, it's Dragon from the BIDS team telling you to listen to today's episode. Our guest is Bert Sarkonen. He's the author of The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing. Seven unique posts and beam styles to accentuate any design theme, second edition. The book is for those who want a fresh sense of home style, lovers of architecture and design, and those within the timber framing industry desiring a visually stunning and elegant guide on the subject. So, if you want to know more, I suggest you hit play. As always, I would kindly suggest you support the Break It Down show by doing a monthly subscri- subscription. In addition, support savethebrave.org, donate there. And as the final suggestion, I suggest you hit play on this episode and enjoy yourself. Bye bye. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This Sebastian Yoga. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Bert Sarkinen, and I'm watching the Break It Down show. And now, the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. You guys know me, you know I like to keep the audience uh, guessing on their toes, and and I like to bring you people that are fascinating. And Bert is a leader in um, the wood fitting industry, and I guess the thing that is always interesting about being on the show is you get to meet these incredible people, Bert, that you wouldn't otherwise ever even think about, and in different ways to handle problems or or to improve life and everything. And I think you, you fit nicely into our what the heck is Pete going to talk about next uh, uh, medium? So mm-hmm. one, thanks for coming on the show. And two, thanks for doing what you do to beautify the world and, and to take it and make it an attainable, uh, really interesting thing. Well, thank you, Pete. Thanks for the kind words and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You were, you were on a show as I was doing my prep and you were talking about the history of, of wood framing and then the modernization and then the establishment of the West and, mm-hmm. and how things sort of work together to to kind of kill off the art of, of wood framing can can you go, go through that history because i think that'll be interesting for our, our listeners and then uh, i'll finish doing your marquee while we're talking about okay that. perfect so this poster behind me you can see it's an old barn that we did a repair on and that is just an example of timber framing as it was done thousands and thousands of years ago and then if we move to a hybrid system, which is where it's done today, you can see here's one, I'm gonna just hold this up to the camera. There's a kind of a rustic log timber mix. And then on the back, there's here's one that's kind of more modern farmhouse, but done with exposed beams. And that's where it's evolved to. Around when there was railroads, steam powered sawmills and nails became became prevalent, they were mass produced. That's when the westward expansion began. So the transportation was feasible. The lumber was sawn up relatively quickly and they could bang it together with nails. So that produced the shanty towns and that was the precursor to framing, stud wall framing as we know it today. And then hybrid timber framing is taking beautiful pieces of art from the old world and how it was crafted with mortise and tenon and pegs and it's using that in specific locations to create personalization and beauty for homes, offices, et cetera. So you're sort of mixing the old world discipline, which is, uh, I guess, I mean, ultimately you would say it was obsolete, I think, right? That's fair. And then, That's fair. Uh, mm-hmm. but you're using that, that the beauty that it takes to, to not use a nail in a joint if you don't need to, and to let the wood kind of do the, uh, the work of the beautification part. Correct. Yep. And it's as from my perspective and the, the people that shadow our doors, there's I'm jaded or, or somewhat tainted is my perspective, I would say. But but DNA, the beams, the exposed beams and wood has been used for dwellings and gathering places for so long. I feel like it's part kind of baked into our DNA when we're around solid wood structures. And there's people around. It's just kind of this belonging, love. I mean, all these deep needs that we have as people are somewhat scratched. That itch is scratched in a way. Yeah, I think about a sheetrock surface painted or whatever it is versus an open wood 
surface inside like a cabin or whatever it is and there's something about that wood that you see i don't know that it, maybe it's uh maybe it's primal to, to have that you know like fire is primal right you see, mm-hmm. and things are just a little bit better and we want to be in we want to be in water and and uh, being surrounded by timber is i mean it definitely doesn't connotate a negative feeling it, i i think universally i would say it creates a positive feeling I, I would agree with that. And there is something about vibrations. You may or may not have heard this theory, but that every every object, inanimate and living, has certain vibrations. And as humans, our emotions can actually change the vibrations that we have, you know, happy, sad, fear, shame, et cetera. But wood has a certain vibration. Concrete will have a cer- certain vibration. And wood gives a good vibe. That's where you, in a colloquial speech, we hear, you just really got a good vibe, or I was getting some bad vibes. And that's kind of what it's referring to. And then on the other piece of this artistic hybrid timber framing, it's so you get your good vibes, you get the nature, you get this this solid piece of our DNA kind of sated, but we've also got personalization. One time early in my career, I was working through different styles with timbers, with hybrid timber packages. And I was thinking that, you know, I'm going to kind of run out of ideas here pretty quick. And I was sitting in church and then some young guy came by with a pair of jeans and they were all scratched up, you know, the personalized tatters and whatever they do with the studs. And, and he walked by and I'm looking at those jeans and I'm thinking, hang on a second. They keep on coming up with variations on blue jeans. I don't think I have a leg to stand on. And and that's been true. And really, the creativity comes from our clients. They'll come with certain parameters, certain constraints. And that really just fuels creativity and it's a lot of fun. So my hat is off to all of our clients, past, present, and future, because if I was on an island or in a lone room, creativity would dry up. Yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can understand that. Um... It's funny that you're, you know, you're, in, you're doing worship and that kind of thing, and God come and touches you. And you're in the house of the Lord, you you get inspiration about wood. But I've found in my throughout my career, like the creative aspects of what I do. Once you unlock something, it unlocks a multitude of some things in that vein. And so, mm-hmm. how, how do you marshal that, man? Like when you, when an idea comes to you, a, a new way to to present wood in a different, you know, in a new unseen fashion, or or rethinking somebody else's approach. How do you keep track of that? Like, do you, do you try to it, like, draw it out or what do you do when you're inspired? So inspiration takes many forms. Sometimes it's a niggling thought that grows slowly over time. And other times it's just this pow, flash of infra- inspiration. And as far as controlling it, it kind of all seems to be good. There is a negative side to it, which I've referred to. I've been teased about it as a purple purse syndrome. And the way this came about was just like you said, that how do you control that? Sometimes I'd be working on a project and I get this flash of inspiration. Oh, this idea is going to be dynamite. And I drive off with it like an excited horse, just boop, 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 boop. And I don't pay attention to, is this really something that these clients will want? Or I don't, so I can just take it and charge away with it. And I did it enough times that, my my uh, people working with me started teasing me. They said, first over there working industriously on a purple purse. I don't want a purple purse. Nobody wants a purple purse. And Slay so started saying, oh, purple purse again, when I would. So that's the only downside to the, like controlling that creativity is just making sure that I don't run with it too hard and stop paying attention to the road road signs. I want to go back a little bit. You're talking about the history of wood framing and everything and the expansion of the West. And you were talking about how nails really changed the game. Uh, how were, you know, and you think about the camera in the old West, when whenever they would take a picture, they would always look away. Like they still hadn't figured out how to do like an aesthetically pleasing pose. You know, you. Uh-huh. you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh-huh. over time we figured out how to use cameras in a much more natural way, you know, and, and we've, gotten better at it but i'd imagine the nail is the same thing can you talk a little bit about the history of nails and and then how people displayed them and how they put them to work you bet well i'll start with a piece of trivia so pete if you were a builder say two thousand years ago 
and you were able to get your hands on you know a few precious nails or a handful of nails where do you suppose you would use them in the building process yeah somewhere to support a lot of weight you know because it's metal and i'd want to keep like the main beam of the house off of my head spoken like a true engineer right. except you're ignoring human nature <laughs> nails were a sign of wealth so they were used in the drum roll front door <laughs> i love it i love it, <laughs> I love it. yeah but we don't like, like you know it's just like windows having a window was a sign of wealth right you know it, mm -hmm. you would take mm -hmm. bottom into bottles or whatever it was to make a window of any fashion kind at all and yet to have nails is is something interesting I, yeah I wanted, just to kind of give us the frame of mind as we frame up wood so when someone's thinking, okay, I want to uh, zhuzh up my house and and expose some wood and and do some things, the standard industrial like you know like the patch that you put on and you bang into place that you know that puts joists together that is mm -hmm. no way aesthetically pleasing. It could be retro or it could be rusty or whatever. But mm -hmm. what do you do like when someone comes to you and says like, hey, we want to vault this ceiling, we want to throw it up, we want to see the wood, but you know what you're looking at is not something that was designed to be seen every day. Mm -hmm. You know, there's big big wood trusses that you know we do all day long and they they the spacing on them is one thing it, it really comes down to what people are trying to first we look at what people are trying to achieve for a look and feel sometimes wood trusses that are oversized and spaced too closely can just be overwhelming and doesn't really let the space breathe i mean it just kind of gets really cluttered and and so forth and then there's also if you have a high density of wood, you're also going to drive up the cost of your investment. So balancing the investment plus the looks and then also longevity, what's the strongest, best way to build? All three of those kind of are in the air at once when we're working with a particular client or project. And uh, But the trusses can be, they can be big and robust with heavy arches. They can be angular and thin, kind of like minimalist, modern. There's really, in fact, in the book, there's and then managing the money, the chapter on managing the money. One of the one particular room doesn't change in size, the walls don't change height, the pitch doesn't change, and we give 15 different examples of a hybrid timber application, which gives a different feel and of course a different investment point. And that is without changing the pitch, the wall height, or the room size. And so there's just a plethora of things you can do to, to capture what is going to be the best for you to put a long, fuzzy smile on your face for you know, a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And, and then when you, when you think about uh, building something. I mean, are you guys doing more like retrofits? Are you building from scratch? Like, give me a sense for when, when you, I mean, obviously you guys can do any part of a project because you're professionals, but what's the most common way people take and put you guys to work? Well, so we wear two hats. We kind of have a designing hat on the front end and then the subcontractor hat, subcontractor hat on the back end. And by far the biggest value we provide is in the front end. Because getting the raw material and putting them up is technical, and, and there's certain aspects you got to have expertise. But but you know a trained monkey can do that to some degree. Um, with the design part of it, you, you mentioned retrofit versus working with new plans, and the new plans are easier in many respects that you can you can change a lot of things without too much hassle. But the the Big trophies in my mind for myself come from the retrofit, the retrofit, because any changes you're talking dollars. So you really start, so you're minimizing how much you change. And so it really feels like you pull the rabbit out of the hat and just make this complete makeover. In fact, we've got some, some pictures in the book and there's other YouTube videos and whatnot. In one particular project, we were accused of that we didn't, it wasn't even the same house. So that was a compliment, even yeah. though it wasn't intended. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. And then, uh, what? Actually, I just at my friend's house the other day, and they've got this uh, lovely little like relaxing area with a hot tub and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. the centerpiece of the fireplace—it's an outside like living room. It's Southern California, mm -hmm. outside a lot. 
And one of the centerpieces of the area is this old piece of this old beam of wood. And they've got a matching one from somewhere else. And mm -hmm. you know, this is something that has really taken on one. It's, it's good for carbon sequestration rather than burning that old thing. Right. But two, it's got character and it has a story. Who even cares about the stupid story? But the people that buy it do they're like, like this came from a kid's hospital that was blown up in World War One and then rebuilt. And then like all this stuff goes into this piece uh -huh. of wood. It doesn't have to be decorative, but do you guys have an element for what you do? Also, we are like we have all this fantastic repurposed wood or, or what do you guys do about that? Mm -hmm. So that repurposed wood, that element of, of a story or something larger than yourself and all that feels good. And so a lot of people like really it's it's kind of cool, you know. Yeah, maybe it doesn't make practical sense. But uh, so we have reclaimed wood. We have suppliers that have reclaimed wood with history attached. And we've also, we've got a mill. So sometimes we'll take trees where they have to clear for a home. And those trees will put into beams so that can be part of their story as well. And kind of going to that same, speaking to that same need, um, really a lot of fun. And that sequestration you mentioned, that's, there's a book that you may be interested in, Pete, it's called The, uh, the New Carbon Architecture. And it, it really hammers what, the sequestration of carbon, and it talks about the three big of building material, the three big, the wood, concrete, and steel, and how wood takes less energy to bring from raw material to building, and then buildings that are that use wood, not only do they sequester carbon, but they they take a lot less energy to use to heat and to cool. So. Uh, that's a favorable thing for our industry as well. Yeah, that's that's neat to hear about. The the other thing uh, I was uh, typing in some things here and trying to pull up some links, but there's there's a, a sawmill, like an old old sawmill that used to take down redwood trees in Northern California, and then they still do. But they handle a lot of the big trees because it turns out that old saw can still just chew through these giant like you mm -hmm. know, eight foot and, and you know because the old trees are. We have old trees in town and LA has a company called, I think it's called Angel City Lumber. And I'll, I'll put these links. Okay. The and these guys go around LA and they take down these old trees that have to come down for, for whatever reason. There, there is like a, a magnolia down here by where we are. And it goes, it's not, it's not on the street. It used to be in a little tree box somewhere, but now mm -hmm. it's got this giant roots and that's probably eight feet tall. And okay. the, the tree reaches three quarters of the way across the boulevard, like four, four lanes and the sidewalk. I mean, at some point, this massive tree, I mean, you and I can sit in each of the little like alcoves between the roots. That's okay. Right. At some point that's got to come down. And they, so a company like Angel City Lumber goes in and they take that tree down and then they turn it into something that you can then go and buy it and, and put it to work or this uh, Sebastopol um, sawmill. You know, they, they, they take these old wood and, and it's gorgeous. You buy it and you're like, and I just can't wait to my hands on this thing and turn it into something anything a table whatever mm -hmm. it is that must be something that you guys have those kind of of sawmills up there where, where they're where they're taking down old trees and and creating a new purpose for them you know there's a there's an old sawmill that was operable it still is operable but it was in its heyday you know, around world war ii and that's in oregon and our mill itself we it can cut a 52 inch log so it can handle some big stuff. Um, and there's uh, other mills around that, you know, are, are smaller and whatnot. And some people have bigger mills, but there's mills that can handle big stuff and repurpose big logs or, or have the ability to saw big logs without dynamiting them like they had to do in the old days. They would put dynamite down the charge the log and pow, split it in half. So they could get a smaller log. You, you've seen the pictures of the log trucks with just one massive log on them. And then uh, in earlier days, when we didn't have our bigger mill, we could we'd get a big log, and it's like, well, here's some great wood, but whew, it's going to take you know so much effort to get it down to usable wood that isn't really worth it. We couldn't pay much for the big logs. But now we got a big mill, so we're set up that way. As far as the going and rescuing trees. There's another part to that. Most trees that are not grown in, in close proximity to their neighbors, 
they're kind of lazy. They get big knots and they don't, the wood isn't as good a quality as something that has to fight for its survival and grow straight up and not have a bunch of taper. And uh, so the, the use of the wood is different. And then you have to be set up to be like this, this company. It sounds pretty cool business model where they go in and save the tree and then repurpose it. Um, I don't know if there's anyone exactly like that around here. I haven't heard about it. Yeah. But I mean, when you think about like a city, like uh, you're near Portland, a city like Portland, mm-hmm trees in the city that are probably over 100 years old and then Mm -hmm. you know dangerous like there is a number of people that die every year from a tree falling and hitting them in a city like that's just Uh, it's just the thing right like oh my god all these palm trees that are so gorgeous and 100 feet tall we are just now realizing they're going to fall down soon you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) because when trees die where do they go you know they don't hang around and stay up they they tend to fall over so it's interesting when when someone comes to you and they're like, Hey, we want to do this. But first off you run, you run this company and you guys do houses and, and all the things that you do. Why on earth are you writing books? Uh, so great, great question, Pete. So the biggest thing is we've seen so many people come in, start the process and face heartache and disappointment because they really didn't, do the right things to get prepared and so chapters one through five that's what that's what entails section one that is really about the owner's responsibility as the visionary of their project and one of the quotes in there is just like a tree must grow roots before vertical grow so must you do the same before you're going to get visible construction growth right and so so many times people are there they're like huh this is a third revision. We haven't found our plan. I mean, we were supposed to be building. I wanted to be building three months ago and here we are. And it feels like we're still on square one. And I understand and can empathize with that frustration. But the fact is, is they've actually moved a lot of material. They've done a lot of work in even establishing what they don't want. And so that, that section there is probably the biggest reason that we wrote the book. Section two gives people an idea of what they can get. There's seven different styles laid out so they can get an idea of how they can personalize their home and kind of just make something resonate. So they can just kind of surround themselves with a peripheral warm smile. Um, and then section three talks about some of the pitfalls and little tips to implement the hybrid timber framing with the regular construction process. So, uh, so it's not a technical read. This is something that is missing in the timber frame book world. There's a great number of books that talk about joints, tension loads, pegs, sizing, uh, relish, all these all these terms with how to make the timbers function with different joinery and, and historical books that are great. This is more, if you're gonna put it in feed, it would be how to get looking for you want if you like the looks of exposed beams, if you intend to use exposed beams, timber framing, post beam in any fashion, this book will help you really get a handle on finding what you want and getting what you want. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and it's the it's so the the people that are 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 buying this book, they're trying to. I mean, are they are these people building second homes that are trying to redo something special, or are they trying to increase the market value of their house, or are they just trying to warm up what they've got? Like, can you characterize the kind of person who buys this book and gets a lot out of it? Mm-hmm. So they got to be attracted, of course, to exposed beams and wood as, as a starter. They're not starter homes by any means. These are people typically building their forever home or a vacation home. So. And there's three ways to really calculate value. One is increasing the the overall value. One builder, when he's building spec homes, said he got a 35 to 50% return on the money he spent with us because we would change roof slopes and doll up the front with these timbers and make a nice entry and, you know, bang, the impression, the curb appeal is better. So it kind of increases the value of everything. That's one way. The other way is if, for example, you wanted it if if you would do a timber package that increases the beauty of it, you're gonna have something, an investment that's closer to liquid cash. It'll sell fast. It's not ugly, right? 
Mm-hmm. And but the big kahuna, the reason why people do it is to personalize and to make it nice and for their enjoyment, for their family, or their friends, for their morning coffee, all of the above. That's the big reason people want to have something cool. It's just neat. I wanted to ask you, have you seen that movie? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, it's got James Cromwell in it. He plays like an older guy who's got timber on his yard in, in Canada. And he's like, I'm just going to build a house. And he does does it the old fashioned style, you know, and I guess like he come from a family of shipbuilders. And so they know how to join wood and everything. Mm-hmm. Have you seen this movie? I have not. You know, and the and the drama is, you know, the, the movie part of the drama, who knows how much of it's real, but he starts, you know, he drops his own trees, has his own sawmill, and mm-hmm. is basically making a house by hand in the traditional style, and he's he's doing all of it himself. And the uh, the local government can't handle it because most people can't handle that kind of work, especially not a 70 something year old man, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, and he's doing it all himself, and, and I believe with a lot of hand tools too, you know, just mm-hmm. putting the wood together. And uh, he had to fight tooth and nail to to go through the permitting process. And he was tried to work within it. But when they weren't able to do it, he's like, I know how to build a home. I, I'm just going to keep mm-hmm. doing it. And he fights and fights. And ultimately, they have to acknowledge that the wood was top notch. You know, that everything about what he was doing was working. The joints were, you know, incredible. And the house was stronger than anything built, you know, in the area mm-hmm. for a long time. Mm-hmm. Because, mm-hmm. you know, that thousands of year old technique. Of, of joining wood together. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, do you ever have any kind of problem like that? Like with what you guys do, like, you know, permitting changes, people get uncomfortable about something that's just made out of wood maybe or something, but how does that, when you guys, I mean, everybody says, Oh, you got to pull a permit, but if you know what you're doing, pulling a permit is just a, a process typically. Right. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's some engineers balk and don't want to get involved with it. Others, their eyes light up and they want to kind of, oh, just it's the same engineering. It's just different values. A, a wood peg has a different shear value than a half-inch bolt, which just for the record, a white oak peg that's an inch and a quarter in diameter has the same shear value as a half-inch steel bolt of mild steel. Oh, okay. So, so um, it's bigger, but they're the same in terms of what they Yeah, and so then you have to calculate how far is it from the edge of the wood and different things. Uh, and as far as trouble with permitting and that, most of the time it's it's all right. People, the the counties and the jurisdictions that that are approving plans, and they they say, well, if the engineer looks at it and says fine, well, then uh, then they're good with it. But there are there are eyebrows raised here and there, and you have to talk people off the shelf. That's good to hear. I mean, it's the movie. Like I said, they really dramatic uh, drum dramatize the uh the, the conflict between the old man and the institution yeah. it's like john henry steel driving man and he's taking on this uh this thing oh, wow but i mean it is incredible though to, to be was it a documentary then uh it was it was uh based on the story and it, it's okay you know, that guy, he's Car- Cromwell often plays an old irish guy or whatever okay he's a curmudgeon and goes out and he you know he still knows how to cut down trees mm-hmm. you know and like, this is my last big thing I'm going to do. I'm going to build this perfect house on this perfect lake on my perfect land, you know? Uh-huh. And and uh, and he does it. Like, he pulls it off. But uh-huh. you know, it seemed like it was harder for him to deal with the government than it was to deal with uh-huh. <laughs> work and everything, you know? Right. Yeah. Anyhow, um, when people talk to you about this, and they try to give you their vision. Like, you know, you think about that, that show about tree houses and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, think it's something that's just otherworldly a lot of times. How do you translate what they're doing into something that's actually uh, achievable? That's, that's just a great question. You could even look at that as a loaded question. Because most of the time, you or I, if we go to buy a pair of shoes or a new computer, we kind of just truck off to the computer store and we haven't done our homework. And just like like a tree growing its roots, we don't really know why totally we want a new computer. We don't really know why we want. And so we get there and then we're kind of hit with questions and all these things we haven't considered. And that's just for a simple purpose. So you, you talk to someone about building their forever home or their dream home or whatever. And they put some thought into it, but just a minuscule amount of they don't know what they don't know at that point. And so how do 
I translate what they're telling me with this very narrow vantage point to something that is going to delight them for a long, long time, what they really want. And I guess the biggest thing that I do, Pete, is I really try to get their expectations right-sized, you know, real. Tell them that, look, this is going to be a, a process of quantity quantity over quality. Most likely, we're going to move from A to B to C to D. In many iterations, you're going to get more and more information. And you're, you know, you'll know when you cross the finish line. But we just, so I just want to preach patience. The first ideas we come up with may or may not be good. There might be pieces. We're going to do a lot that you don't see in the background. Bring some stuff to you, and we'll figure it out, and we'll slowly whittle this down. But really, preaching patience and getting them to understand that that there's a lot they don't know about themselves yet. And of course, the exercises in the book will help streamline that and speed it up. But it, it really is it really is a crapshoot. And you know, a lot of times we'll see people that come to us, and they've been through a few designers already. And I don't per se just throw the designer under the bus right away. If that designer hadn't talked and really preached patience and got people set up for the process that it could be long and arduous, it could be a little messy, and it could feel like they're getting nowhere, if that message isn't thoroughly landed in the client's head, well, client's probably going to get frustrated if it doesn't go fast enough and then out the door, you've got a black eye. And so that's uh, that's really probably the biggest piece of quantity over quality. You've probably heard about the the students doing clay pottery. They did a test. One half was graded on producing the perfect project, and the other half was graded on weight. They need to produce X amount of pounds of pottery that semester to get a good grade. And the the half of the class that went for the weight for quantity. They had the better pieces in the end. Mm. Yeah, there's that. Uh, I talk about the elegance of work, you know, and and taking that slower, which seems more frustrating path of really sorting out the uh, decision process. Typically, nets if you're able to push through and produce, which is what you guys do, uh, typically nets a better, more refined, elegant solution to the problem. You know, like okay, yeah, I can throw a beam up here right now. I can get an axe and I can hew that, but um, you know, that's going to be expensive. You're going to pay a guy to, to swing mm-hmm. an axe all day and, you know, mm-hmm. we have, to have its imperfections or we can, you know, do this modified approach where we have the same thing or whatever it is. Right. And like and asking extra questions may not be what the client wants to hear, but ultimately it's what they need from you. Right. Yep. And it's uh, like I spoke about the purple purse. I mean, the air goes both ways, but so it's a team, it's a team effort. You know, it, it really is. And, and if there's that understanding that, that it's not going to be perfect every time, but little by little, it'll evolve. And they will know when we, when, when we cross the finish line, no one has to tell them. And uh, if, if that message is landed and taken to heart, it always goes good. My, uh, my girlfriend and I are reading a book about uh, aging and how in the medical community, there just aren't that many uh, doctors that focus on geriatric care. Uh, there's just not much money in it. Uh, the mm-hmm. pain is problematic, you know, and, and you get to a point in life where you really just can't fix certain things. And so mm-hmm. you just try to make them comfortable, whatever it is. And so it's creating these problems of like, uh, it turns out nobody wants to go to a retirement home um, mm-hmm. and a living place because it's just, it gets worse and worse and worse once you enter that area, even though they try as hard as they can. So one of the things that, that, um, that people are thinking about is doing is building a, a smaller property a smaller home on their property and having a place to retire to, mm-hmm. you know, already set up. So you're not refitting a house. You still can use your house for, for other things. But w- when you think about something like that, a project where like, this is going to be the place where we're going to ease into the slower years of our life. Um, how practical is it to do something like timber frame it so that it looks fantastic and feels fantastic over the, I mean, you're talking about a, a form and function kind of argument between like, mm-hmm. man, it's be gorgeous, but it's also going to cost an extra hundred thousand dollars to mm-hmm. have all this timber framing. But maybe that's what you need 
you know, I, I don't know, help you. How do we deal with something like that where someone's, someone wants to build a, a mother-in-law unit in the backyard and they're trying to balance the form and the function? And you're talking like the ADUs or the tiny homes and that sort of thing? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've actually got, thought about the same thing like you did. And we, we've got seven, seven different styles of the same footprint. So it's a small ADU, I, it's like 400 or maybe 600 square feet, maybe 800 at tops. Right. I think it's 740, 740 square feet. Two bedrooms, kind of a main living area with the back patio off the back and then a nice little entry. And the same exact floor plan, but with different roof lines to create different styles. So kind of a neat concept. A builder could run in if they wanted to create this community, same exact foundation for everything. And then boop, 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 put up different styles as they need them. Um, so the practicality of it is, you know, if somebody wants to do it with, with timbers and that, it's you kind of have to throw getting your money out of it and all these. You just have to say that I'm buying this because it's artistic. It makes me feel good. Uh, I'm going to be happier staying here with it. And then it's really doable. if if you know the head screws get turned in that way or if, if it's in line you know in line with what people want if, it, if you're going to try to justify it money wise that's a fool's errand so this is this is a more of a, an artistic venture than it is so but you can still put the form into the house like mm -hmm. i think that's easy to get in out of no step yep. all these things where you know the bathroom can already be built to handle someone who's got limited mobility or or planning on having less mobility yep. Yeah, this this particular plan has a shared bathroom. It is big enough to, and the doors are wide for wheelchairs and that sort of thing. Um, if anyone's interested, it's on our website under floor plans, and they can they can take a screenshot and go run with the idea. I don't care. <laughs> and then there's the uh, the link. If you're looking online, the arrow timber arrow timber dot com, and that's where correct. That yeah, mm -hmm. you can also go to Bert's website too, by the way, and check out his work there specifically. Um, what, you've written two books now. Is there a third book in the works? Well, this is, uh, there is a third book and we've just got an article. It, it, it's kind of buried on the website, but the article is a business approach, a business strategy to getting a timber frame. And it, it's going to be part of our next book. And it's talking about trade-offs. So one example that we have in there just for, if you were going to have a truck, you you know what kind of truck do you want well you don't want a dump truck because you know you don't need those kind of payloads but maybe you you tow an rv or you got a boat or right and so you're you know you go through that process of where you want to be on that spectrum so you're not going to be a fast sports car or a motorcycle you're not going to be a dump truck somewhere in between so you have to say the message in this in this trade-off article is that you have to, the best way to deal with trade off is to figure out what you're saying no to. That's the hardest part when we're trying to figure out what we want. We can kind of define what we want, but if we don't really deal with what we're saying no to, this fear of loss just is kind of just chomping at us the whole time. So you have to say, okay, well, I'm okay with less gas mileage. I'm okay with hassle and tight parking lots. Right. You know, all the things that, that you're giving up, once you do that and, and reconcile yourself with that, then you got a chance of moving forward without being plagued by doubt and things like that. And so that is the trade-off paradox. Yeah. And with the, if you can imagine building a home, you've got a, just a ton of trade-offs you got to deal with. And so if you're kind of weighing on the fence, you decided, okay, I'm not okay losing this. So, so I want better gas mileage. Well, in this car analogy, then you have another trade-off you have to give up. You know, one, you, you reach for one trade-off, well, it's going to push something else off the table. And so that's part of this book, and it's all about floor plans, floor plan trade-offs, because that's where you see people really struggling. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of goes to the thing we just talked about with the form and the function part of this. Mm -hmm. How much time do you spend with your hands on wood creating and, and building? These days, it's not so much. I mean, I'm headed out to do an install here in a few weeks and looking forward to it. It makes my time kind of crunched up because now I'm out on the job. And that is, uh, 
it brings me back because I've had a whole lifetime of working with tools, right? And so it's like, like, like uh, easy as falling off a log, go right back into it, down the groove. And it makes me realize how rewarding that is when you, at the end of the day, there's something physical that is there. And unless it burns, I mean, it's, it's there, it's created. Yeah. And there's something very rewarding about that. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Mostly the guys are fabricating the shop and I'm the pinch hitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is it a hobby for you still then? Like, do you mess around in your own little wood shop to make things? Is everything in your house, you know, framed in timber? Like, Hey, here's my wood uh, milk jug and here's my. Mm -hmm. wood. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the funny thing is, is I like the design. I like the artistry. And I like the big construction, the bigger stuff. Mm. My wife is kind of going into grandma mode. We're expecting our first grandchild. And she got online, she paid 14 bucks for this life-size big blueprint of this cradle that rocks side to side rather than in front to back. Yeah. And that's where both our, our heritage is both Scandinavian, and that's what they do there. And so she got it there and she says, you know, I need you to build this. And I'm like, honey, this this takes a lot of different tools I don't have. And I'm just gonna have my brother do it. He's he's got a wood shop. He likes this sign, you know, that furniture type of stuff. And uh, and so that's the way that's going. Kind of ironic. Yeah, kind of ironic. Yeah, but it's funny because you know, there's different like people want to make everything has a wood solution for someone like you. You know, like oh mm -hmm. yeah, that TV remote that'd be better if you put a wood frame around it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> everything gets it, but but not in your case, and that and that's good. So what do you spend your time doing if you're not designing and working and mm -hmm. yeah, all those projects? Like, what's your hobby? I, well, one of my hobbies is I like to break a sweat. One of the rules that I've lived by is it's kind of kept me in the exercise mode is never take a shower without first breaking a sweat. Mm. So you can only go about three days and you got to do something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that's always a fun release for me. Um, I like to read and I like to write. And then there's just family and friends and socializing, church, all that stuff. It seems to fill up time. Um, Let's say that I, I want to uh, I want to hire you guys to come down to Southern California to build a, a home for me, or I live mm -hmm. um, Wisconsin, and there's tons of wood out by my by my cabin in the Dells. And everything. Mm -hmm. You guys push out and and do things in uh, national. Yeah, one of the one of the things that makes it easy is Doug Fur grows here on the West Coast, and it's it's got so many qualities. It's like the optimized building wood, mm -hmm. and so it's people are already importing that, or it's already getting trucked across. So if we do a kit first, it's just less shipping weight. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yes, yeah, so we've we've had projects go to Florida, to Alaska, Minnesota, Arkansas. California, Montana, all kinds of places. Um, and we're not general contractors, so we're just there for the getting the timbers erected at the right time. So it's fairly fairly straightforward process. Yeah, yeah, okay. And if you were really handy and, and, and ambitious, you could say, well, just send me the kit, instruction, yeah. and uh, you know, I've got a strong back, weak mind, I can handle it. <laughs> What's having me actually? So, I'm in a tent right now, you can't really see, but I'm in a tent, and uh, it's a good compromise as we were trying to figure out what was next. But we really are thinking about building a structure in the backyard that would probably be at least in some ways a studio, you know. And so, okay. uh, you know, strong back, weak mind, you know, and plans I can follow. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's something that we're looking at trying to figure out is, is what do we create mm -hmm. that, uh, that will you know be multi purpose enough that maybe we could rent it out or maybe it'll yeah. be. Or maybe not, but these these are the kind of. I mean, there's. A, I'm not the only person thinking about this. There's got to mm -hmm. be hundred thousand plus people out there, like thinking, how do I create more living space on the property that I have? Or mm -hmm. you know, if I go buy this piece of land, it's twenty four thousand dollars, but now I need a shed on top of it or yep. something to get started. Yep. In fact, Pete, um, one thing to put in your hat is we're doing an outdoor living area now that is we're designing screens that pull down. In between the post, so when you pull it down, you could have radiant heaters above, like a gas heaters that do whatever, and you can have screens or an actual 
fabric that keeps the heat in or mm -hmm. or you could go to a bug type screen but um yeah yeah, yeah really a lot of options yeah there's a lot of options which besides Doug for its and its practicality and its idealistic nature, what other kind of uh, wood do you like to create with? Well, there's a lot, a lot with cedar. Sometimes people like the color. Sometimes if it's going to be totally exposed, they prefer using cedar. There's sequoia, Port Alford cedar, which is actually a fir. There's some oak. Um, and the further you go east, there's a lot of oak that grows there. So that's where you see oak used more. It's a really strong wood. It is heavy. Uh, it's harder to get in long, straight length. Um, and then it's twisting and, and shrinkage is kind of off the charts. Mm, yeah. The pros and cons there. Mm -hmm. yeah. one, of, uh, one of the companies we met along the way is a company called Linwood, and they make wood, uh, like a wood replacement, and it's made from flax stalks. Basically, they take the flax stalk and they unroll it, right? And it's a waste product. Mm -hmm. They right. resin it and then they you can shape it to be anything like the first thing they made was guitars and these guitars are incredibly strong it's strong like carbon fiber is strong but okay. with a better resonating uh, factor I don't know what that matters about but. but one of the things they're doing is like they're looking at how do we and it's it's uh, uh, they'll say it's carbon neutral whatever either way you're, you're sequestering these stocks that otherwise mm -hmm. we get or something else um, mm -hmm. It's just this gorgeous, you know, because the stalks, the way the grain runs on it, it's just this gorgeous, uh, you know, wood-like appearance that is incredibly, incredibly strong, but at a tenth of the weight. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, what are your thoughts on some of these newer woods and composites and, and other ways of approaching the wood problem? You know, I think my hat goes off to people that are in trying to do these things because there's, we need that. Back way back in the day when there were before cars, there were people predicting that cities would be buried in horse manure. Yeah. And and you know, it was ingenuity and genius thinking that that brought about a solution which now has its own problem, which I think the cycle will keep moving around. Um there's a a guy I know that has had an invention to to take garbage and with high heat and water, steam and press garbage into little bricks and it gets neutralized, sterilized, so bacteria can't grow with this heat. It has to have a certain amount of plastic in order to work, but this has never taken off yet, but when he's gone to these big garbage people, that you know, the, the big companies that, that are doing garbage, they're like, how much for this? Because if you could compress that garbage yeah. and turn it into something that's a building product, yeah. I mean, you're winning on so many levels that it's it's crazy. So, yeah. so I I just look forward to see what what comes out of these you know, these inventors and people that are thinking and doing on ideas because there's good stuff going on. There really is. There's a lot of exciting things out there for us to be able to do this. And then talk a little bit about if you can. Um, you know, we, we often worry about building things out of wood or replace, but wood is a fairly replenishable product, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, are we managing that okay? Uh, for From my perspective, it's, yeah, doing a great job. There's more more for us now than there was in the turn of the century. Right. Because of the replanting and managed growth and whatnot. And it really is a renewable resource. Like you mentioned, it is from raw material to building material much less energy than concrete and steel and then it, then it uh, does the carbon sequestering as well as uh just being warm and you know resonates with us as as humans and then easier to heat and cool so i, I don't think wood's going to be gone anytime soon no it makes a lot of sense and like you said it'll just keep growing back uh, we're coming up on the anniversary of the death of Harry Truman, the guy who was a Washington resident and he lived at the, you know, the base of Mount St. Helens in 81. And they're like, you got to go, Harry. And he's like this 80 year old guy, World War One pilot. He's like, yeah, uh -huh. I, don't, I don't think so. If it's going to blow uh -huh. up, I'll always say that you've been saying that my whole life, then it's going to uh -huh. go with it. But what are your thoughts on a, on, a, on a guy like that? Who's, who's just 
sad, determined to to live his life in his own way. I mean, you can't get a well, you, you can't now, but you know, it, there's not many places that are more beautiful than the lake that he lived on. Mm -hmm. Spirit Lake, yeah. yeah Spirit so lake. you've seen the eruption, I take it. Yeah, yeah. the whole hillside just caves and slides, just incredible. It was remarkable, like and for miles, just the knockdown yeah. bridges that were like, yeah, that used to be something of a bridge, but not anymore. <laughs> Yeah, they, if they would have blown the other way towards the coast, there would have been mayhem, annihilation. It would have been ugly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as far as Harry, you know, cussed old codger, he was just bold and said, no, nope, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go. You got to respect that to a degree. I, I don't think I would ever be there, but and there was enough, enough people and enough things going on that uh, – there were there were a lot of uh, reporters and whatnot that didn't make it out as well. Yeah, it was a dangerous that and yeah, time to, time to be there. And you're right, the uh, that mountain can go any of those mountains in that area. You know, they go in the wrong direction, and and it's uh, it's pretty devastating. Well, listen, what should I have asked you that I didn't ask you? I know you got a bunch of birdisms and sayings and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But what, what do we want to wrap up with? Um. Well, we know maybe one takeaway that uh, it's in the book as well, but it's called a decision compass. And so like the next time you go to buy a pair of tennis shoes, a computer on a simple level, or you're going to build an office or your, even your studio, one thing that you can do to build a good decision compass is to kind of give a summary of what you're trying to achieve. Okay. And as you do this summary, Try to pick out the keywords, boil it down to three to seven keywords that are integral to your summary. And if you can have those keywords with you when you're making a decision, you can back up and, and look at those, those keywords and that'll, that'll, that'll bring up your executive summary, what you're trying to accomplish. And, and then you can say, if the, is this a bright, shiny object? Or is this a great thing that you stumbled off that's going to move you in the direction you want to go? Right. Love it. Well, everybody can get Bert's book, The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing. It's the second edition. You can go and, and get that on Amazon at the link. There's another book coming. Basically, if you're trying to plan that next dwelling or trying some upgrades and, and you're thinking about wood as a decorative and a functional thing, it sounds like Bert's the right guy for, for that job. Bert, anything uh, you want to say in closing before we close it up here? You've been a great host, Pete. All kinds of questions that have brought a lively conversation. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>